being open, but being unconditionally open to all kinds of experiences. Um, take on opportunities. Do more than what you're asked to do. Don't don't just do a job. You know, have a career, have a presence. You know, do more. You know, go for talks, curate workshops, do in design installations, do, do enter competitions. You know, that's basically what I've done. You know, do everything, go everywhere. Say yes to taking on new challenges. Um, take on challenges that nobody else is willing to take on. At least you'll stand out. Um, and be restless. You know, the main thing is about being restless. And restless, you know, so people use that word negatively. You know, this person is restless. Restless is a very good thing. It's an intellectual state of mind. It's not a physical state. It's a state. It's, a phys it's an intellectual state that keeps you kind of always hungry, always, you know, never be complacent, always be restless. So um, that th these would be my, you know, my tips, as it were, to the generation that is just starting off. Stay restless, stay hungry, stay foolish. That was a small snippet from today's episode with Dr. Anuradha Chatterjee, who is presently the Dean for Faculty of Design at Manipal University, Jaipur. This episode is going to be a total treat because we're going to dive deep into the Academia of Architecture. We start off with a brief introduction of how Dr. Anuradha got into architecture her time at University of New South Wales pursuing masters in architectural history and theory and also eventually a PhD. We also talk briefly about her book which is John Ruskin and the Fabric of Architecture which has been endorsed by scholars of international standing and then we dwell on topics such as the architectural education in India, reducing the course duration from five years to three years, the importance of incorporating more of technology into the curriculum and also learning more about technology, integrating site with studio, how do we teach architectural design, also widely known as AD, plagiarism, especially in PhDs, importance of architectural journalism, advice for students, what's the future going to be like for the architectural education system, and we also touch briefly about women in architecture. So you get to learn her story, her journey and her plethora of experience which she's going to be sharing in this episode. It's a great treat not only for students but also for the academia in general where you get to learn more about the education system, what it has in store for us and where we're headed. So for more on the episode head to arkgyan.com slash 44. We've written extensive show notes with relevant links and if you want to explore more about academia, architectural history, journalism, that's your go-to resource. With all that said, let's head right to the episode and join in for a wonderful conversation with Dr. Anuradha Chatterjee. Let's go. You're about to enter the Ak Young Podcast. Ak Young Podcast. India's first and very own architecture podcast, where you'll hear the insights, experiences, and journeys from India's leading architects. No matter what your skill level is, together, we'll build on our knowledge and share architecture's greatest stories ever told. Now, here's your host, Manish Paul Simon. All right. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Let's kick things off. Give us your background into how you got into architecture and was it something you wanted to do like always? Hmm. So um, Manish, I'm what they call an accidental architect. Um, I was an aspirant for the MBBS examination. I did the examination twice. Um, oh, and right. because we were sitting for a lot of these um, entrance exams in Delhi, about 250 seats, you know, um, I I was not I was not much of a person who was into rote learning answers so you know I was never cut out to kind of you know clear the entrance exams mm. but I was really clear that I wanted to do like an architecture like a you know like a professional degree mm. um, I had no knowledge of architecture except that you know I knew that I was a spatial thinker and I was you know good at art and sketching and mm -hmm. um, and so when the opportunity came up to go, you know to go to TVB School of Habitat Studies it was I think one of three schools of architecture in Delhi at the time in 1992. Mm -hmm. um, I said yes, you know, I'll 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 give it a shot. So um, so I sort of called myself an accidental architect, but you know, um, it was a good accident and a good risk then because it paid off and and still in love with architecture after all these years. 
Awesome. And you had quite a long career and like you achieved quite a lot. So before you get into all that, uh, could you briefly tell us about your experience studying in TVB School of Habitat Studies and uh, and then you mm. transitioned to doing uh, to doing your MR, right? So maybe a brief on that. So um, TVB was, TVB School of Habitat Studies was uh, founded by three practicing architects in 1990, hmm. um, Ashish Kanju, AGK Menon and Ashok Lal. Um, and, and TBB was what they call the first wave of avant-garde schools in India because it was an argument against a lot of the you know schools of architecture that were set up in 1950s and 60s. Hmm. Um, and and TBB was was very focused on giving us an education that was not just about buildings and typology-driven designs, but also about thinking about habitat. Uh, it's so much more than, uh, you know, just architectural urban design. The focus was on, on people, hmm. on centered, people-centered designs. So it was sort of, it was sort of in part a rejection of the commercial paradigms in architecture that were being kind of, you know, promoted by, um, or, or seen to be promoted by other schools of architecture. Our um, education was very student-initiated. We were taught by a lot of visiting faculty at the time. Hmm. Um, so we, I think we grew up to be incredibly self-reliant, resourceful, but at the same time, very critical and brave. Um, so this was, I mean, it was, it was a great, it was a great experience. TBB since then has, has then, has merged with uh, Guru Gobind Singh Enterprise University in Delhi. So it's right. still continuous, but in a different form and shape. Yeah. It still continues with the same name. Uh, no, it's it's. I think it's called University University School of Architecture and Planning. But we still they, they still have a lot of the original sort of the founding faculty members right. and still work there. Yeah. And you have one of the first batches, right? I was the third batch. It was a very interesting. Yeah, it was great to be part of a you know a new school, a new ethos, and you know like um we were like the founding batches. You know, the first five batches is considered to be the sort of the founding batches of any school. All right. So. Yeah, it was, no, it was a great experience. Um, and I mean, it, it made us it made us really prepared for for life itself. So I really kind of I'm very thankful for that experience. Yeah, it's great to hear that someone actually liked their BR studies in India because most <laughs> of us, uh, when we do masters, we, we feel mm -hmm. a big difference, right, than what we've mm -hmm. uh, taught in school and back at home. Mm -hmm. Yes. Look, um, I when I finished um, architecture, I felt like, um, well, I was, you know, I'd, 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 I did a bit of practice, but then I kind of quickly joined masters again because I felt like my education was incomplete. Mm. I felt like I needed to learn more. It may be a good thing or a bad thing, but, you know, it may, may say good things about an institution that, you know, it fills you with, with the desire to learn more um, or that you felt somehow that your education was incomplete. Mm. Um, but, you know, at UNSW, I saw that um, they actually had a master's in history and theory of architecture, which was not available in India at the time. And I think only now SEPT has a master's in history and theory of architecture. It's after so many years, you know. Mm. Um, so I thought, you know, I, this is this is something I really wanted to do. Um, Theory and history was something that um, wasn't taught really well. I think in, in a lot of schools, I mean, at least at the time, I'm not sure how it is now for students, um, although we try to make it sort of more accessible and, you know, um, relevant and all of that. But, you know, theory was seen as something that only a certain pedigree of students, you know, um, could get into, like you, you, you could either get it or you not get it. So it was in, in some sense, it was not inclusive. Um, inclu uh, including uh, history as well, you know, it was history of, we, we had really good history teachers, but, you know, as an architect and a designer, you kind of felt like, well, why am I studying all these things and not, not everybody's going to become a conservation architect, we're going to be designers, so what is, what is the relevance? Yeah. And luckily when I, and, and I say luckily because I didn't really have an understanding, I mean, how much understanding does one really have? when you're joining a master's program, right? But the master's that I did was focused on looking at um, theoretical paradigms mm -hmm. in historical architecture. Um, mm -hmm. So it was not about history, but it was theory in history, which made it really interesting and relevant. And so even till today, you know, we can talk about um, analogies between bodies and buildings. The, an idea that starts with Roman architect Vitruvius, and it was it's discussed even till now, including textiles and buildings and you know so these these are kind of like you know enduring um conceptual ideas which i think is really important for students to know about so i was incredibly uh, fortunate that i'm also made the right decision in terms of you know the master's degree 
Awesome. But uh, yeah, when we apply for masters, we don't really have an idea. It's just the mm-hmm. mark, right? So what inspired you to take up architectural history and theory? I mean, I, yeah, like I said, you know, it's one of the things I, th- I felt like I hadn't learned in my bachelor's. You know, it's a, it's, it, it seemed like a missing link. Hmm. So I thought, you know, it's one one way to do one way to close a gap is to do a master's in that whatever you didn't know. Well, I mean, I think my attitude was always that, that you know, whatever you don't really uh, whatever you haven't mastered, do that. Don't do something you have already done before. So so the, so the, the decision was fairly easy. All right. And then you went on to pursue even a Ph.D., right? Yes, yes. So um, again, that this idea that you know, once you're bitten by the bug, you know, um, this this bug of learning. Yeah. Um, I was also really inspired by the campus culture and generally by the by the culture of education, and I and I really wanted to make a contribution to mm. to to education, and um, you know, and I thought yes, PhD is definitely something that I needed to get done. Um, but also that, you know, it, it was also an opportunity to to learn. And, you know, with the funded scholarship, it's like, it's a luxury, um, you know, that you have, it's a privilege, you know, that you, you get to spend three and a half years uh, pursuing knowledge and, you know, making a contribution to knowledge. Yeah. All right. So in a way you were chalking your part towards the academic uh, side of architecture. Yes, yes. So I think by that time I had, I did, I did make up my mind, you know, when I, when I'd gone for masters, you know, I, uh, when I saw the culture there and, you know, I saw my supervisor, you know, delivering lectures, it was an aha moment. And I thought, well, you know, this is what I want to do with my life. You know, that I had that, I got that clarity, you know, that this is, this is, this is how I want to spend the rest of my life, you know, that this is inspiring. You know, if you can spend time and effort inspiring and educating you know, students and an and auditorium full of full of you know, up to 200 students. This is what I really wanted to do. So, um, so PhD seemed like the natural course. Um, yeah. All right. So do you feel that all PhDs in architecture tend to uh, direct themselves towards the academic side? Or do you feel that there is some amount of people who also join back the workforce and maybe be part of the R&D or something along those lines? Yeah, I mean, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, uh, the life after PhD doesn't have to be teaching. Um, yeah, so a lot of people either go back into the industry or remain researchers, lifelong researchers, mm-hmm. or, or who become sort of educators like me. So I get back into teaching and now I'm, I'm beyond teaching. It's gone, gone into academic governance and, uh, you know, sort of um, the management side of it. Um, I, I think a PhD is important, even though, like you know, you know in India at least, it's these uh, the, the idea that um, you know um, universities and UGC itself is making these ideas quite sort of mandatory that you have to have a PhD. And I know people, a lot of people are critical mm. of these ideas of that you know you don't really need to be a, have a PhD to become a good teacher. But yeah. you know, I think it actually does something to your brain. I think it really opens up the way you think. I mean, I, I think the way it's being put forward as this kind of a mandatory, you know, this kind of this dogma, you know, I think that's wrong. Hmm. But I think people should want to pursue knowledge, but people should want to learn more. And I think what PhD does is that it really teaches you skills of research that hmm. masters doesn't. Hmm. And skills of research in the sense that it doesn't have to be research on a paper, but it, any project that you handle, whether it's a, you know, a, a, a construction project or a design project or a writing project, or a curatorial project, you know, you you tend to treat that in a researchly rigor. You know, mm-hmm. you treat tend to treat that with a researchly rigor, which is what I think the PhD really does. It it it's a kind of a skill building along, like you know, and it really gives you the li- license to research. And I think anybody who does a PhD um, will find, hopefully, will find that their teaching as well becomes a form of scholarship. Otherwise, before that, I mean, I've seen it with a lot of colleagues who are doing. Who are, who are amazing academics, amazing teachers, um, mm. but they're not able to teach their teaching. They're not able to treat their teaching as a form of scholarship, as mm. a form of um, research, which I think PhD will definitely help. And, and and to be honest, you you even though you specialize in your PhD, at some point you will either automatically uh, move away and become more diverse in your interests and expertise or, you know, or you'll be required to do so. Um, that takes about a few years, I think, but it's, it's really worth it. Um, right. I mean, yeah. it's, if you like learning, if you've got a topic that you've got a passion for, I think you should go for it. And you were also balancing teaching as well as the PhD, right? That's how it generally works, right? Yes, 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 yes. It's, it's, it's quite hard. It's, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, to kind of balance, I mean, but, but then I was, 
you know, I wasn't I wasn't balancing a full time job and a full time PhD. And a lot of people I know in India and overseas who do who balance that. And I had soft to them. I couldn't have done that. So I was doing my PhD full time and I was doing a lot of part time um, teaching. And and it sort of keeps you relevant. And, you know, I mean, it, I was always doing design studios whilst I was my math, my PhD was in history and theory. Hmm. Um, I was starting to see the connections between these so-called disparate, you know, um, fields, um, which was really helpful. So I could see the connections between what I was researching and what I was teaching. And um, that was that was really helpful. And uh, a typical PhD program is not like your general uh, semesters that we have in our bachelor and master's, right? Oh. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an annual. I mean, at least the one at UNSW. We did. We we got like an annual. We had an annual review. So it was like a three, three year plus half year extension where you're writing up your. Um, but yeah, absolutely. It's 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 such a self initiated project process. You know, I mean, it it can be seen as great. Like a you know like you know there's a lot of space to focus and mm. you know you can have, you can, you know discuss these ideas with your colleagues, but. You don't really have classes and it can feel quite isolating that, you know, that you you are pursuing something because you're so much in your own head for three years and you're just doing something that nobody really understands what you're doing. Hmm. Um, and definitely it can be a bit isolating. But as long as you have a, a community of people and community of scholars that are there to you know support you intellectually and emotionally, it can be quite fun. All right. So you've gone on to write few books in the field of architecture, one of them being John Ruskin and the fabric of architecture. So could you briefly tell us mm. about, uh, was this part of your research and the, your PhD or was it after you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, um, so yes, it does, it does emerge out of the PhD itself. Um, mm. so, but it, it takes about nine years, um, right. which is, which is, which is good because, uh, often what you get is a lot of PhDs now are publishing their PhDs as books. Hmm. Um, I had the opportunity, but I kind of hold, held off and thought, well, let me get a bit more perspective on, on what I've, I've written because of, often what happens is that you, you're so in love with your PhD when, once you finish it, you know, you kind of just replicate that into a book, which is, which is fine, but then it reads like a PhD, which is hmm. totally different from a book. And so I, I took a few years to kind of, um, really repackage this and I wanted to be go with a good publisher as well. So Routledge is one of the top publishers in the world academic and academic press. Um, mm. So, um, and yes, it did take uh, about two to three years of sort of intense <clears throat> rewriting. Um, and I, when we had it reviewed by, uh, you know, two top scholars um, in the field. Um, so it does, yes, it does come out of that, but I've, I've, I've had two other publications before that. So this was sort of the final one. I mean, before I kind of get on to the next one, that is, yeah. All right. And uh, what were your next steps after you completed your PhD and uh, your education in architecture? Um, yeah. So um, obviously job search, as you can imagine, you know, 2007, 2008, so oh. sort of almost start my, you know, job search. My, my, you know, my, my supervisors were absolutely clear that I shouldn't be looking for, shouldn't be getting into a job whilst I was writing my PhD. Hmm. Because then, you know, it sort of compromises what either your job or the PhD itself. So I really sort of sort of started applying when I'd handed in my examination copy. And um, so worked, I worked in a few places in Australia. Um, and again, it was a question of kind of, you know, career progression, how do you move ahead? How do you do more? Um, and that sort of took me to the different positions and countries that I worked in after that. Awesome. And you're, you did become an Australian citizen, right? Since you stayed there for so long. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Cool. So uh, you're a re senior research fellow with the University of Queensland. You're a regional editor at Taylor and Francis Group. You're the dean right mm -hmm. now at the Vani Institute of Design. And you're an mm -hmm. also an author and you do so many things, right? But how do you make all this happen? Mm, um, see, I, I can say time management, but um, I think time management is something that you learn if you want to take on, if you want to do something. Um, I'm the kind of person and probably, um, and it's probably not a good trait, but I think it's a good trait. Um, I say yes to a lot of opportunities. I, I hardly say, because I mean, I normally get a lot of good opportunities. I'm very grateful for that. Um, but you know, so it's, it's about, it's about making time. I think, I think if you, if you have the passion and if you want to do it, uh, I'm not the nine to five, I'm not, I'm not a nine to five kind of a person. We never have been, hmm. you know, you know, that as in architecture school, the entire format 
of this nine to five on weekend just it gets totally out of the window yeah, um, yeah. and that doesn't change you know when you're doing masters and phd it's it's you know, you're kind of working you know really hard but you know the point about academia is that you've got to work so much harder to make your presence felt mm-hmm. and to because peer peer esteem is everything you know how you're positioned how people look at you um whether whether you're seen as somebody who has substance and clarity and you know commitment all of that is so important it's not hollow publicity it's not about the social media you know sitting on a stage and getting your photograph taken but you really need to have substance behind backing you up so mm-hmm. I feel like if you have the motivation to be somebody and stand out from the pack um you'll find time you know the time management and all of that stuff is is fine but um but it it really is not the key i think the real key is to have a passion um of course blocking out times for meetings times for research makes things easier to handle and you know it it can get stressful but in the end it it's it's wonderful to be able to do i mean even now like i should point out that i'm also the area editor for the for a global encyclopedia on women in architecture hmm. which needs me to correspond with authors in about 20 countries and review their work and the emails come at basically all hours of the day and night mm-hmm. and uh, and I, i i took on this position i didn't even ask you know are you going to pay me what are you going to pay me because it's an important job you know to edit to be this to be the editor for asia for mm-hmm. a global encyclopedia on women in architecture you know very few people will get this offer and yeah. very few and and it's such a worthy project like you don't even think about it you say yes and you think about your contract and on and all of that all of the time commitment later so mm. yeah that's just also comes with personality i think yeah and thing i think that was one of the reasons why if i was in your case i would have settled down yeah. in australia for good but you sort yeah. of moved on you went to shanghai and then now you're in india right so what made yeah. uh, you decide to move out and come back yeah here? yeah that's a great question that's a that's a great question um because see it's also opportunities finding you and you finding opportunities i think it's this kind of alignment you know i've always been sort of you know i got i got the chance to go and work in um shian jiao tong liverpool university which is a partner university which was a partnership between a sci- with with the, with the chinese university and a british university mm. and my colleagues were from basically every country in the world so this was like united nations like it was it has this global representation of academics mm. um and i it was a higher it was a, it was a promotion so i went from you know senior lecturer to associate professor then i got head hunted by sushan school and then by abhi as dean um i sort of chased um you know opportunities and, and and vice versa and opportunities have chased me as well so yeah you're absolutely right but but i i think i'm always attracted to places where there's an opportunity to do more to make a contribution where something needs doing hmm. um shanjar liverpool university again was a new university it was about we were it was into the fourth or fifth year in its architecture program uh, hmm. and again it was great to be part of that part of something new is what is really exciting you know whilst it's it's good it's good to be part of something that is established but the excitement of you know um of contributing to something that is new is is it's really i think there's that kind of a rush that you get which i which i really love so um yeah so i've kind of moved around and i've moved uh, moved towards um places where you can have a greater impact and greater opportunity really. awesome and yeah definitely i feel that uh when you come from another uh, culture and another country where you studied so much mm-hmm. it's basically a thing to uplift your uh, as a dean the college and bring up mm-hmm. the standards right so what are the different challenges you faced when you jo- came back to india and worked as a dean and uh, now as a dean mm-hmm. at avani Yeah yeah I mean see the work culture you know I mean people say you know west you know you know places in the west are professional and you know india is not so professional mm. I mean I think I think these kind of polarities these kind of binaries are not useful to think of you know mm. I think every place has its own working culture mm. and it's about how do you how do you become an effective communicator how do you become an effective leader how do you manage to get the best out of people of course there are challenges about getting deadlines met and people you know um doing things in a certain way and and of course you know even the commitment for instance to to becoming academics is very different like you know in in sydney in in and in and even in china we i mean people who really wanted to be um academics they are other ones but you know who enter academia but here we have a lot of people who are sort of you know waiting out 
the playing a waiting game and mm-hmm. yes you know but you have to manage these things and and it, it was hard re-entry was hard you know spending all this time away and then you come back and i think when we say kind of landing you know um landing takes time you know mm-hmm. and, yeah. and to really touch down and you felt like well at, at some point you've touched down but but the landing process is is takes takes long um mm-hmm. And but but to polarize the debate and say, well, you know, something is professional or not unprofessional is not really helpful. It's, it's to kind of understand that whether it's students or faculty or administration, people, these are these are work. These are work cultures and, and the underlying work being culture, the word being culture, which one has to understand and work with to get the best out of people. All right. Uh, there's a lot of new architecture schools coming out and uh, mm. there's hundreds of architecture students graduating, but they're not really yeah. equipped uh, to face the real world. Right. And there's a lot of companies who complain about that. So what has been your experience uh, in imparting architectural education in India? Or was it that our system lacks something that maybe we can improve upon? Well, I mean, I, I have, well, I've got mixed feelings about that. Um, one is that, um, yes, we do have a lot of architecture schools coming up, but, and I'm part of that wave, am, am I not? Because I'm is about five years old now. Um, yes, yeah, so new schools are coming up all the time. And, and I would imagine that that's a response to need for schools. Um, at the same time, you know, I think, yes, the industry is complaining about certain kinds of students coming out. But, you know, my... Look, my 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 view on this is that I mean it's a two-way street. Um, the, the, we 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 don't really look at the academy as a service orientation. It's not in service hmm. of of the industry. I mean, students have to fit in, but there is no. I I challenge these these ideas of you know by these ideas of real world and not real world and the inside and outside and you know. Um, I think I think the I think the the learning journey of an architect architect is a continuum. It doesn't it starts at the academy, but it doesn't end at the academy. So mm-hmm. to expect that, I think these are kind of false expectations. Um, so that's one side. One side is that um, that you have this expectation that you're somehow going to simulate industry practice in academic practice. You you can't do that. Mm-hmm. At the same time, um, you uh, the, uh, acad- academia and academics need to have an understanding of practice. Mm. They need to have. I'm not saying that they should be practicing architects who should turn into academics, but even academic practitioners should have an interest in design, should have an interest in construction, should have an interest in technology, should have an interest in politics, on in economy, in in, in the financial condition of this country. You know, they should be interested. You know, academia, I argue in one of my forthcoming papers, I argue that academia should not be academic, but it should definitely maintain, um, you know, its uh, its focus, I, th- I think, is on, you know, creating critical practitioners, you know, whether they're academic practitioners or industry practitioners, but creating critical practitioners, people who know what they're doing. They're not just going with the market, but yeah. they understand the market, they understand the country, they understand the political environment, and they work with it and work around it. You know, that's that's what we should be doing. In that. So I've got mixed feelings about that. It's not a yes and no sort of a question, but um, the the issues of of new schools cropping up and um, is is uh, the, the the issues are also finding good faculty. I, I think you probably agree with me on that. The, yeah. the, the question of finding, you know, quality workforce. You know. Um, that's that's an issue, I think. Um, and do you feel that uh, architecture as a profession is, uh, I mean, the value goes down the more number of these schools that pop up and. Uh, um, um, no, I, I, I actually I actually don't, because I think, look, society still doesn't have, a, have an understanding of what architecture is hmm. and what architects are. I, I think I think the real challenge is uh, is having that nexus with 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 society at large we i don't think we're doing a lot of work in that mm. we're not doing a lot of work in terms of making under, making making ourselves understood um making our work um legible you know to to society at large so we complain about fees and we, we understand you know so um 
the legitimacy of architecture has to be established much more strongly and we have to make an effort to do that i think as i mean academia is part of the profession profession is not separate hmm. we are we are part and parcel of the profession and we have to i think you know the academies should take on a, a stronger role in reestablishing the legitimacy and relevance of the profession in in society but i don't think i don't think new schools um coming up i I, I trust what Council of Architecture is doing. I mean, in that sense that they are maintaining quality, you know. So clearly, um, I, I would imagine that we are in good hands hmm. um, because they're, they're a statutory and a regulatory body that um, makes sure the quality of these schools hmm. um, is what they would like and that they're compliant with whatever the other minimum standards. Um, the question, however, is that while the council is doing its job in terms of maintaining minimum standards, um, we are not looking at, I mean, I would I would want the profession to be not looking at minimum standards, but looking at excellence. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we build excellence, not quality. So going beyond quality towards excellence. Um, and, and I think, you know, some schools, you know, some new schools are trying to do that. And I think um, it'll be interesting to see what, what, the, what the impacts really is. But, um, but that's what I'm, I would really be interested in to see how we can move towards excellence away from minimum, minimum basic standards and minimum quality. Yeah. Uh, don't you feel that we can achieve excellence if the course duration is reduced from five to maybe three years? Mm, mm. Yeah, I think that's that's an interesting proposition. See, a lot of a lot of countries are already doing that. The mm. three plus two model has been yeah. out in Europe, in in Australia, in the UK. Um, I think it um, it makes a possibility for a student to get a first degree and exit as a non-professional degree holder. Hmm. So you have a lot of people complaining that a lot of architects are not practicing, but, you know, because probably they never intended to, hmm. you know, so I think that's good that after three years, they can exit and get a non-professional um, degree and, and, and then really interested students, people who are interested in um, the discipline and the profession can do it as a two years professional masters. Yeah. Um, see, we already have that. You know that we already have that in the curriculum. We have the three plus two. We have the basic and advanced levels anyway. You know, we have in a lot of colleges, we have three years, uh, you know, like the six semester basic degree, and then we have internship, and then we, you know, have the three final semesters, which is more advanced semesters. So, in some sense, the three plus two format is already embedded in an architecture mm. cur curriculum. It's a matter of, uh, it's just a matter of, it's a technicality really to kind of split that and, and then to kind of think what, all right, what happens with, with people, what, what is, what does this three year degree look like, you know? Um, in in Australia, they call it Bachelor of Architectural Studies. So you're not an architect, but you're a graduate of architectural studies. So you still get a degree, but right. it's architect. Yeah. So um, so see, so Australia already has this, you know, this three plus two um, format. And the when you graduate with a three year degree, it's called I think the Graduate of Architectural Studies. So you're right. not an architect, uh, but you 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 have a degree, not a diploma, but a degree in architectural studies. So that sort of, um, and you can take you can take time to figure out if you really wanted to get it into, into practice, into the profession, or whether you wanted to get another degree. Maybe you want to do management, or you wanted to do media writing, or journalism, or fashion, or you know. So that gives you the chance to do something else. Like you get your first degree, and you can and you can do something else, which is absolutely fine. Because I mean, in the end, the student has the right to curate. The, and, and their learning experience and, and you know, and formulate, a, you know, a craft their career along the lines they want, really. All right. I think you probably know that there's a lot of things happening in terms of technology and the way we're progressing as architects. So we, we need to be beyond just architects. We need to learn computational thinking and all these new tools and techniques, right? So do you feel that more yeah. of technicality should be imparted in our architecture schools than the, just the subjective way of uh, designing and being abstract? I, I agree. I think I think all of this is actually actually quite important. But I think it would be I mean, I would be keen to look explore more with, you know, the, the more emergent, the emergent forms of practice. Um, I know a lot of people who are into computational design in India and uh, and overseas. I'm I'd be keen to find out to what extent um, these practices and, and at what rate these practices are growing and what what the academy can can do on that at this point we you know the schools are normally doing a lot of workshops that students are paying for to kind of get that tag but i think it needs to be to become something quite embedded you know having said that having said that the fact the need for 
you know, integrating new technologies and new, um, new, well, new forms of technologies. Um, I, I must also note that um, a lot of students and a lot of students don't even have an understanding of the conventional forms of technologies. Yeah. So, so I'm, I also note that that gap and saying, well, generally, um, we need to we need to become more interested in um, in in understanding technology, new or old. Um, but I note that gap. That, that's there, but I do agree that we do do need to include them, but not as stack, you know, not as kind of you know um, things to kind of tack on to an existing curriculum, but something that should become more embedded um, in the larger curriculum itself. All right, and don't you feel that especially during my architecture school t- uh, days, I never actually went to site. The exposure to site was less, and my studio mm. was pretty much in the classroom, right? So, do you feel mm-hmm. that maybe we should integrate a lot of uh, site visits and the construction yeah. techniques? Uh, I I hundred percent agree with that because see, um, we again because I, we, because a lot of us were taught by visiting faculty and by practicing architects who were running projects. We um, almost all of building materials and construction. Um, we learned on site. Um, I believe that you it's you cannot these things are concrete things. You cannot make them abstract. You cannot learn them through drawings and desktop work. Hmm. You cannot do that. Um, I, I do I do will even including history of architecture. Look, I mean, I'm a historian, and a lot of times we are teaching students um, history of buildings through photographs. Hmm. How is that possible? Yeah. You know, exactly. that you're teaching. So you you are not teaching them about buildings. You're teaching. You're showing them photographs of buildings. They're not buildings, mm. right? So I think education generally in architecture tends to be abstract and very desktop and classroom driven, mm. and that is a problem not just for design or construction, but for almost every subject. Um, and I think a, a level of real world immersive hands on experience is, is is important throughout the five year degree. Um, and that's how we learned um, most of our, like I said, most of our construction, we understood, you know, um, how the how the brick was being laid, how the foundations were being built. I mean, we, we saw we saw it, you know, hmm. we saw coming. I mean, this is this is I mean, witnessing is, is, is actually very important. My worry is when I see students drawing things out of a book. It's just it's it's a two dimensional thing, and and a building is not a two dimensional thing. But yet yeah. students start at the desktop. It's really worrying. Um, definitely, you know, I, this this is something I'm really interested in, constantly pushing my colleagues to think of, you know, how do you how do you make these things more palpable, more hands on, you know, hmm. um, including including history of architecture. All right. All right. I want to talk briefly about AD, which is architectural design. We have this pretty much in most semesters during architecture school. But how yeah. exactly as you have like a plethora of experience, so how would you say that we could teach AD better and uh, build this sense of uh, design in students? Hmm. Um, I think, yes. So, so design. So I think uh, I think the, at least from what I've noticed, Students tend to respond well, I mean, well, if you treat um, your teaching as a collaborative process, Hmm. Um, if you just demand things and if you give instructions of what is required, um, that is not teaching. Um, So I, the way I work with my students, whether they are first year students or final year thesis students, the master students, you know, this is teaching is a collaborative process, including design. Um, so, you know, so for, for design, you need to be more hands on, you need to be able to communicate the ideas in your head. You, you need to love design for starters. If you're not, if you don't love design, don't teach design. Hmm. Um, so that's, 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 the, that's one of the fundamental qualifying parameters really. Um, and, and of course students need a lot of, um, you know, resources and, um, like you, you need, you need to communicate, um, some good examples or, but, but really the process that you is there to teach design has to be, has to be collaborative where I'm not saying spoon feeding. It's, it's very different to spoon feeding it. Um, so, but a hands-on teach hands off teaching in, in design, which I've noticed in a lot of, you know, um, studios is, is probably not the good way to do teach design. All right. And, uh, you- I'm, I've for been following some of your work on Instagram and you keep curating new events and uh, you keep conducting workshops. So yeah. how has uh, been your experience being a dean at Avani Institute of Design and maybe help the institute grow and become better? Um, yes. Yeah, so I think what, what's, what's been, 
one of the one of the major reasons for curating these events and for workshops and lectures is is to give students the exposure, which mm-hmm. is exposure that we had. Um, you know, if you're in Delhi, Mumbai, you know, these things kind of automatically you're in it, you know, you're kind of in the midst of it. Mm-hmm. If you're not in, in a metro city and students can have, um, I suppose, at least for me, a disadvantage or a setback in terms of not being, not coming across things, not yeah, being absolutely. exposed to a lot of things. So, so the main intention was that I probably wouldn't do this in a, in a, in in, you know, I'd probably do it differently if I was, you know, um, leading a school in a metro city right. uh, where events are happening in the city itself and that you can just access. Um, the students um, are, are inc- incredibly grateful. I mean, I think, you know, it's it's built that exposure. It's, the, the approach has always been to get, get a diversity of voices. Hmm. So not like one kind of practice or one kind of uh, an architect. So we tried to get people who are involved in architecture, built environment, um, city making more broadly from all disciplines. So this kind of interdisciplinarity of, of architecture, we really want to expose students to that. It's not just about architects coming and presenting their projects. There's nothing more boring than, you know, students <laughs> coming and presenting projects. Oh, look how wonderful my building is. You know, beautiful photographs. Yeah. We wanted architects to come and talk about their process. So, you know, when people like Peter Rich come from South Africa, hmm. They don't really just talk about show us pictures. They talk about the process of consultation. How do they talk to the community? How do they, you know, how do they establish their, you know, their relevance and legitimacy? And, you know, all of that is so, you know, to hear the stories of practice, not the products of practice. You know, that's what that's what we've been really focused on. Um, and I think we've been really successful with that. But, um, yeah, so that's um, that was the intention behind curating these events um, at Abney. All right. And I also want to talk about uh, the dialogue between the faculties and the students. Uh, A lot Mm. of architecture schools, the students are in a way uh, scared of their faculties, right? They they don't really approach them and... uh, Mm. their heart out compared to maybe if I, I'm sure like if you st- you're in your time in Australia there was yeah. there was no gap between or maybe there's mm. no line between the faculty and the students so how mm. do you feel uh, we could bridge that gap and mm. I didn't know there was a gap between faculty and students um, or that there was but yes I do I do sense that 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 students are definitely a little bit more um, apprehensive, like, you know, they, they could WhatsApp us or at any time. Right. But they don't. Hmm. So I'm, I'm never sure if that's out of respect or out of fear. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, see, I mean, in interpersonal relationships, right. It's, it's, it's all about interpersonal relations and, you know, um, how do you build that? And that's been an ongoing conversation that we, we, we've undertaken at Abni as well. You know, how do you, how do you build a rapport with the students while, I mean, how do you become their friend whilst not being their friend? Yeah. Uh, you know, not, how do you become a professional friend um, to somebody and how do you become approachable? I mean, that takes, that takes work. Um, you know, um, as a dean, I've always made myself approachable. You know, I've had, I, you know, at lunchtime I eat with the students at, you know, so I used to live on campus at, at one point. Um, and so we used to be having dinners with the students and that, but then they tell you all sorts of, things about themselves, which is wonderful, which are always in confidence. But, but the point is, it's that trust building thing, you know, that you have to do with the students. Um, and you have to keep the trust as well. So um, I think I think it, it really, it, it takes work, you know, and you have to be interested in student life, uh, in, in youth, and you have to just stay in, stay in touch with who, how you were as a student, you know. Um, so when students are bunking classes or you know, um, doing whatever they're not supposed to. Think back to your when you were 19. Uh, um, you know, get a perspective on that. And I think a lot of people tend to lose perspective on that, tend to be disappointed very quickly and, you know, um, tend to kind of, you know, zone out, you know, when students don't, um, um, you know, do do what they're being asked to. But, you know, this is a, this is a long degree. This is a long process. And learning is a long process um, and a few things here and there doesn't really matter. So again, if it's about being patient, um, patience, um, openness, um, you know, um, being being relaxed around students and, and, and that whole point about an interpersonal trust building, I think these are really important in bridging this um, so-called gap, I think. But you know, the point is that the faculty age nowadays is getting younger and younger, right? Yeah. Um, 
So I, I, I imagine that that would be much easier than it probably was in the past. Um, so, All right. Yeah. Mm. All right. And uh, this month, I think next month or maybe in May, they might have their thesis. So uh, a lot of students mm. find their thesis over, overwhelming and uh, daunting. So what tips would you give to students who are just approaching their thesis? And uh, <laughs> My God, yes, I know. Um, we Because we are leading the thesis program now and, uh, you know, it's it's been hard it's and but in a way i enjoy it you know i mean so we've got we've launched a thesis program which is this idea of uh design as a research inquiry where students are not just doing a project but the project is a vehicle to undertake um and you know a, an inquiry which is into an architectural question that they need to frame and the project becomes uh, a kind of a, a, a you know a means to an end hmm. um of course they have to demonstrate all the you know the design and technical competence but um it needs to do much more than you, they need to do much more than just design a building um incredibly confusing incredibly um you know um i i think i think the students have to worry less about that i think it's more the the greater onus is on on the school and the faculty itself so what we've done is we've created these clusters this is these design clusters hmm. and uh, so the students are supported by not just their advisor or the supervisor or the guide hmm. but also two or three other people in the cluster so each right. time we meet we meet the students individually but also meet the students in teams as well nice. so they, they they feel greater support uh, they don't they tend to not fall off the wagon um, and get lost you know there are there, there's a peer group of 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 their own colleagues but also there's three or four of us at, at any given time that they can talk to us and get support. Um, so that's been a massive help to the students. Um, the main thing I suppose to keep in mind for thesis is that is, is it, it, you, you, can, you can get really lost. Hmm. The thing is that for four and a half years you've had, you've had structure and hmm. suddenly the structure vanishes and suddenly the studio vanishes, suddenly your class vanishes, timetable vanishes, suddenly you know, you don't really have anything to fall back on. See, for four and a half years, your life is predictable. Hmm. And suddenly said, you're told, now you go and do this by yourself. And they really don't have the skills to do that. Hmm. Unless you have like a pre-thesis semester where you kind of do the structured letting go of, um, of the students and prepare them for independent study. But I think the problem is, um, I, I would say the onus is a lot more on the institution than it is on the students. Um, yeah. um, and I think that's that, that's something that we've been thinking through, you know, how do you create a pre-thesis semester of that, you know, that um, self-initiated study, that 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 skill building, um, because it can be incredibly overwhelming and, and, and you can feel really lost. I was re incredibly lost. Time just seemed to just tick, you know, just go by and yeah. you have no sense, you know, days become weeks, weeks become months and you really don't know what's happening because the, suddenly that structure and you know you've been in the structured environment since you were in grade one in in school. Then you go school to college again, incredibly structured, and suddenly in the fifth year the structure vanishes. Um, so and it's not fair. So we've tried. We are trying to mitigate that by creating these clusters and by, and by creating sort of regular check-ins with clusters and with advisors and um, yeah. So hopefully it'll all go well. But yeah, I can I can totally empathize with what students going through. All right, and a lot of the students the final hurdle for them is the thesis and most of them just to want to get it over with. So, yeah. um, uh, there was one instance where in SPA Delhi, there were students coming and copying, uh, thesis books and, uh, thesis topics. So how do we, uh, you know, build these original ideas in students and not. That's, yeah. So that, that's what I, that's what I meant. You know, we ask, so we are tracking student progress. See, we have, we have a process. So there's no student who can copy anything because the point is we are we are tracking their progress. When we're mm. seeing, we are tracking how they're evolving their ideas. So definitely when we see a brand new idea, we're going to question that. We're going to seek, we're going to check the origins of that. Um, so they started with, the students started with giving us three ideas and it was shortlisted. Then we had a discussion, it was refinement. Mm. So there is a process. As long as a student, as long as the institution and the student are together in that process, 
you will have very few instances of students kind of, you know, kind of ripping off mm-hmm. other people's work mm-hmm. and claiming it their own, or even outsourcing. You know, what I've been reading all this time about, you know, students outsourcing theses. Yeah, even um, the models you know, in particular, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Models, models and also, also there are people who are offering to write uh, to do the thesis for them. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, if you have a rigorous thesis program and a rigorous methodology. Um, or for a thesis program in place, and you're you're vigilant, and your your coordinator is vigilant. These things will not happen because we are we are if the coordinator and the advisor. We are tracking the students' progress from day one, from start to finish. Um, the point is to help them. So obviously, if you let them go, they will find a solution, and that's a solution is to outsource it or to rip off some ideas. Um, so yeah, definitely looking at plagiarism is absolutely we have zero zero tolerance towards plagiarism, hmm. um, and students know that from the outset that will basically just will just cancel your work. We are not going to, and it's part of the academic policy. Um, so hopefully, uh, in terms of policy and practice, that should that should keep students on track. Yeah, I, I remember reading the newspaper that plagiarism is more prevalent in the PhDs in India. Uh, oh my God, yes. Yeah. It's interesting because uh, how how is that possible? So I've been a supervisor with the Manipal University um, and I know that even the proposal that the candidate submits is run through Turnitin. Even the proposal, that's hmm. it's a high level of, of rigor. Hmm. That even the proposal that you submit to undertake a PhD, to become a candidate, is put through Turnitin, which will pick up, you know, whatever level of plagiarism there is. So we do have softwares and I'm surprised that, you know, um, that universities are accepting PhDs and, and, and master's theses and undergraduate dissertations, and undergraduate theses without the use of, you know, these softwares, which you can, which you can obviously, um, there's, a, there's an institutional subscription to them, but um, it needs to be used. Um, I, my God, yes, I've, I've heard that as well, that the amount of plagiarism that there are in PhDs that, you know, you never know. And also outsourcing, that can also be done. You know, if somebody, you can hire somebody to write a PhD mm. for you. Again, the process, I go back to the idea of process. If you, as an institution, if you have an engaged process, then you, there are very, there, there's very little chance of this happening. It's when you are not having an oversight, an overview, it's only when these things can happen much more. I think. But uh, don't you feel that a lot of students find language as also as a, a big barrier because yeah, because, yeah, 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 I, I, yes, yes, yes. I, that's a good, that's a really great point that you bring up that, you know, so, you know, we are not as architects, we are not trained to write. So from year one to year two, um, there is no requirement, um, to craft a paragraph, to craft a sentence. Mm. And I learned that the hard way. I learned that the hard way from in my undergraduate dissertation and master's and finally my thesis, where I took about nine months rewriting my first draft, every word. Um, but it's, it's yeah, it's I, I, I totally agree. But one has to persist and not uh, rather than take the shortcut, you know. Um, yeah, I get, I get the point about language. Language is a massive problem. And we don't take it seriously enough in architecture schools, you know. Because the focus is so much on design, yeah. you know, design and design competence. We think discourse and analysis and research is just, it's a, it's a pain, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. All right. So uh, could you briefly tell us about uh, your book and, uh, and what, what you're planning in the future as well? Hmm. Okay. So I'm actually, my, um, John Ruskin and the Fabric of Architecture is, um, is now in its second edition. It's a paperback edition. It's been endorsed by a number of international scholars. Um, really, the book is looking at um, how well, um, you know, Ruskin. Ruskin was looked at for as a, for a long time as a person who's not an architect, who doesn't understand architecture, um, and uh, you know. So the uh, my reading of his work was to show that well, actually, he did understand architecture, and he proposed a new def- definition of architecture, which was based on surface. Um, and that there are kind of um, overlaps with that in terms of, you know, emergent technology, emergent forms of practice, you know, internationally. Um, and that, 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 you know, that, that the, really, the real point about the discourse of architecture is about narrowing down the debate to space and structure and uh, interior, whereas Raskin was um, opening it up. So um, 
Um, uh, my next, the next project that I'm working on that I mentioned before was this um, the Bloomsbury Encyclopedia of Women in, Arch- and Women in Architecture. Mm. Um, and uh, like I said, for, from Asia, we have about 160 encyclopedia entries, biography entries. Um, that's what I'm, you know, currently working on. It's a massive project, and like I said, it's a massive coordination project, um, which will really make a, co- which will really make a positive impact. Um, and I'm glad I'm able to talk about it pretty close to the International Women's Day, which is on tomorrow. Mm. Um, it's it's um, it's an incredibly significant project because now now people are not going to have this excuse that oh we didn't know because normally you know in in schools of architecture we tend to teach about the masters mm. and we don't really teach about uh, women practitioners who made an impact because then because there isn't a lot that is written on them. So, um, so this 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 encyclopedia, which is a global encyclopedia, is going to make that make that is going to create a change in that in that aspect. Um, um, in terms of what is the future, um, I'm I'm hoping that I'm going to be the person who helps in bringing about a greater professionalization of academia. I feel like academia in India in architecture um, is not incredibly professionalized. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, that that people start to take academia as a, as a profession, even though we say teaching profession, we're teaching is uh, only a small part of academia. Um, it's a very important part of academia, but it's a very, it's still only one part of academia. So hoping that my, my future next five to 10 years is going to be dedicated to um, building, um, you know, helping institutions build greater professional accountability and professional practice in academia. And you're moving uh, out from being a dean to another role, right, in the coming few months? Yes, yes. So I'll be I'll be joining as uh, the dean of faculty of design at uh, Manipal University, Jaipur, right. um, which is uh, which which has a school of architecture and design and school of planning and design um, in the faculty. So that's going to give the and it'll be an interesting opportunity to work with really talented people, but also work with um, many other disciplines, um, which will be interior, fashion, planning, um, you know, um, fine arts, as well as architecture. So that's always an, a really interesting role. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Nice. And I also wanted to bring up this topic where uh, the world, you know, uh, our attention spans are getting less and less and it's more of a visual world than what is being written down. So do you feel that architectural journalism has uh, some, has a lot of potential or is there no potential? I think, I think architectural journalism, I, I, you know, I, you know, what I want to see emerge is architecture, like criticism. Hmm. I want to see that emerge. You know, we hmm. don't really, we are from a couple of people, we don't really have a culture of, you know, having architectural critics. Hmm. We have journalists who describe, uh, you know, buildings, they describe them, hmm. um, but they don't, they, they are not able to critically reflect on the nature of practice, the, you know, the nature of the state of the profession, the state of, you know, um, but we don't really have um, critics. Um, there we have a few, but but it's not the idea of architectural criticism and journalism. I think they go hand in hand, and I think I would see like to see that emerge a lot more. The visual part, yes, and it's in, it's an incredibly visual world, and again, very disembodied world. You know uh, that you never have to. You kind of trust whatever you see, and um, that goes back to this idea of this classroom. You know, this PowerPoint based, photograph based teaching. I think. I think we've always been, a, we are visual thinkers, we are visual, we are incredibly visually orientated as architects. Um, but I think social media is probably going to make it worse that a lot of what we see, see is incredibly disembodied. Hmm. As long as a building or a space is photographed at the right moment, at the right time, um, in the right light, um, we tend to kind of believe in its um, um, you know, beauty and relevance. Um, but in, in terms of journalism, I'd like to see um, greater greater amount of focus being uh, placed on the development of architectural criticism along with architectural journalism. All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Anu, uh, for coming to the show. And my last question to you would be, what advice would you give to young architects and uh, architects students just getting started? Mm, students just getting started. Um, you know, a lot of my students who finished um, the thesis, you know, they told me when the, the moment they entered practice, ma'am, we're not learning anything. I thought, wow, okay, so, so soon already. Mm-hmm. Um, so the learning ha- is lifelong. Uh, so I would, I would encourage 
everybody who's um, on this path to be be open, um, be open to learning from any experience. You never know. You you don't know that you're not learning. You know that's 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 very being being very judgmental. Uh, being open, but being unconditionally open to all kinds of experiences. Um, take on opportunities. Do more than what you're asked to do. Don't don't just do a job. You know, have a career, have a presence. You know, do more. You know, go for talks, curate workshops, do in design installations, do, do enter competitions. You know, that's basically what I've done. You know, do everything, go everywhere. Say yes to taking on new challenges. Um, take on challenges that nobody else is willing to take on. At least you'll stand out. Um, and be restless. You know, the main thing is about being restless. And restless, you know, so people use that word negatively. You know, this person is restless. Restless is a very good thing. It's an intellectual state of mind. It's not a physical state. Of state. It's, a phys it's an intellectual state that keeps you kind of always hungry, always, you know, never be complacent, always be restless. So um, that th these would be my, you know, my tips, as it were, to the generation that is just starting off. Yeah, absolutely. And we can always keep learning because of the internet. And do you feel that uh, online courses and uh, this online world of learning, right, would slowly replace the actual world? It's a utopian idea, but do you feel that maybe in 10, 20 years? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm I'm actually mentoring. I'm. This is the second second run uh, we are doing. We, we, I actually mentored uh, and I led this um, course on architectural history in the field online hmm. and we had about 50 enrollments from all over the country from you know fourth year students to faculty members hmm. so absolutely you know uh, i i enrolled for courses all the time i think it, it would you know i mean how, how if you come if you come to that stage when you think i know enough that's that's the end hmm. you know you can never know you can never say you can never be satisfied that you know enough you know enough there is to know even now i'd like to sign up for courses i'm i i hardly find time to do my day job so you know but i'm always watching you know even as a dean i'm always watching courses on you know leadership and management you know this is you know i, I absolutely agree with that um, I would imagine more more of a blended um, form, which is not just online, but so online and in the field, you know, this mm. is how it has to I think education has to move out of the classroom and has to be in the field. Classroom is there, but, you know, the classroom can be in many places. You know, it doesn't have to be inside the institution. It can be inside the institution, but it doesn't have to be 100% inside, inside the institution. It can be in the field. It can be online. So I think I think multiple modes really, you know, um, physical field and uh, and online really. Uh, but definitely, I think I think online platforms are making things so much more accessible. But at the same time, you talked about the attention span. You tend to kind of, you know, you also take tend to take it unseriously just because, you know, you can go back to it anytime and you know mm. because it's there. Um, so, but definitely that's, I think the future of education is multimodal, multi you know, sort of a hybrid, yeah. hybrid modality of engagement, I think. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring one last topic, which is BIM. Yeah. A lot of countries are making BIM compulsory and, uh, have you sort of started BIM in your, your, uh, colleges or wherever you're uh, we, teaching? We haven't, no, we haven't yet. And I'm, but, but then I also wonder if it's something that we might start with initially with at, at the master's level mm -hmm. and then kind of try to kind of pilot that, that at the undergraduate level. But mm -hmm. yeah, definitely it would be interesting to kind of talk about that. But then again, I mean, again, I, I think it would be interesting to organize a conference or a symposium with practitioners involved in this to really understand where the points of integration can be brought about at the, at the level of the academy. All right. All right. So we'll quickly jump into the quick fire round and then uh, we'll wrap <laughs> okay. it up. All right. So which book has inspired you the most as an architect? Mm, right. I have a huge personal library because I've moved countries and not every place has a great library. So, but some of the books that stand out have been uh, Beatrice Colomina's Sexuality in Space, Diana Agrest's um, The Sex of Architecture, and there's another book called Architecture and Fashion. So, um, my interests have been in always in feminist critical theory and architectural discourse. So these books, I, I always return to these books. I think at any point, I think I'll, I'll always go back to these books. All right. Uh, what would you have chosen had you not taken up architecture? Hmm. So I already told you that I'm not an accidental architect and I was going to become a doctor, but I became an architect. But if I had uh, more of a conscious 
decision to make, I would imagine it would be fashion design because there is a lot of connection between in terms of um, representation, structure, surface, um, space, inhabitation, comfort, um, durability, you know, mm. um, materiality. I mean, there's a, there's a very strong connection between the two. So if I had a, if I were to make a really informed decision today, it would probably have been fashion design. All right. Oh, what's the best movie you ever watched? Hmm. So um, a movie that I've watched more than once or twice or thrice is Gravity. Um, which I love because this whole point of, um, you know, there's this kind of danger and risk, this kind of, uh, you know, I, I don't know, there's something about perhaps gravity is something so central to architects, isn't it? Hmm. That we're building everything, we, we build to defy gravity. Everything that we do is kind of to defy gravity. So that movie is, it's incredibly interesting and fascinating for me. Always go back to it. All right. Uh, what does a daily routine in your life as a dean look like? <laughs> right. Um, wake up at 5.45 in the morning, get ready, drink coffee, um, take bus to work, reach work 8.30, have a second cup of coffee. So, and light breakfast. So, I'm, and that's enough to get me to hit the ground running um, on a daily basis. Um, yeah, that's, that's my morning routine. All right. I think we, uh, you wa- we wanted to discuss this in detail. So, maybe we could wrap it up uh, with a small discussion in, on uh, women in architecture and how we can challenge the stereotype that has been part of architecture for a long time. Mm, um, Just, yeah, so very briefly, um, I think we can talk about the symposium that we are planning, um, which is, which I I believe is the first of its kind in India and including, including the world that we're looking at gender, the relationship between gender and academic leadership. Um, so there's a lot of, so the work that I'm doing in terms of the encyclopedia talks about um, gender and built, um, so profession, right? So professional architects making contribution by, by their practice. Um, but, the, but the point of um, leadership in academia, in, you know, they're, 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 I mean, more recently you're starting to get a lot of deans and um, heads, heads of departments and vice chancellors um, as women, um, it's far and few, but it's still it's still increasing in numbers now. But so we are looking we are we are looking very closely at what are the barriers, what are the systemic obstacles that um, don't allow women to reach. You know that in, is is there a glass ceiling in academia or in architecture uh, for women? So we are hoping that those, this symposium is going to give us a few you know answer a few of the questions that we are raising. Um, but definitely, we're hoping that some of these initiatives that we're launching is going to, which it's going to make the you know the current generation, our students, a lot more aware uh, and much stronger critical thinkers. All right. Yeah, there was one article which you wrote on the safety of uh, women in India. It's yeah, it's yeah. the mindset uh, more than just the architecture, right? But do you feel that architecture right. also can help in a way? Architecture can help in a way, but it can't guarantee. So my argument was that yes, you know, you can, you can put more street lights on. You can make spaces that are that have surveillance. And but but the point is about you know, an architecture definitely. So one of my thesis students is working on um, sort of you know design, you know, sort of redesign of school facilities to bring about a greater uh, sense of integration, equality, friendship, respect between genders. Um, so I think, you know, so the point that this, my student is working on that I argued in the paper was how do we, how do we raise the next generation of feminist men and women? Hmm. Um, and it's so where the idea of night is going to be accessible to everyone, you know, it's not just about street lights because safety is never absolute. Hmm. Safety is never, you can never guarantee safety. Design can make a space feel safe, but it can't guarantee what happens in that space. Hmm. Um, so the argument is that they, that they have to work hand in hand. Um, that there should be there should be a future. I, I want to imagine a future that is fearless, hmm. where we don't have fear, and therefore we don't we don't have to worry about streetlight. So that's a, that's an argument we're making. So it doesn't exist yet, but you know it's a, like you said that utopian that utopia that we're hmm. imagining a, a future without fear. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Anuradha, for coming on the show. It was a a great conversation. Lots to learn. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. And I'm sure our listeners will uh, have a lot of takeaways and learnings from this episode. Uh, Yeah. What's the best way our listeners could get in touch with you in case they would like to reach out? Um, Email. 
is always the best. All right. I'll put the email and all the other links in our show notes. Please do check it out. And uh, yeah, thanks again. I'll see you in the next episode. You've been listening to the Ak Young Podcast. We're still building the community. Please share this knowledge with someone you know who could benefit. Just send them to akyoung.com where you'll find our free newsletter and for more podcast episodes. Search for the show on any major podcasting platform. Don't forget to subscribe where you're listening right now. And if you liked it, leave a rating or review. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Akyan podcast. I hope you liked that episode. That was definitely a high value episode and I personally learned quite a ton interviewing Dr. Anuradha Chatterjee. So I just want to make an announcement on our recent course which is the complete sketch up and video course for interior design. If you guys want access to the course and if you want like a proper discount which is around 95%, just head to arkyan.com/discount. We've had over 6000 students over 300 plus positive reviews, five star reviews that is, and they are definitely crushing it in the interior design space with awesome renderings. I'm also creating few new courses. It would be coming up soon in a couple of months and hopefully launch a school as well. So that is a small announcement, but I accidentally just revealed it in this episode. So thanks again for tuning into the episode. I hope you learned a ton and I'll see you guys in the next episode. Cheers. Oh yeah, by the way, this is your host Manish Paul Simon aka Kobe signing off. Cheers.